5, I want to begin reading at verse 8. Peter says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith. We've started a new sermon series, and we're calling it Things Unseen. The Bible tells us that the things that are seen are fading away, but the things that are unseen are eternal. For the next few weeks, we're going to be fixing our eyes on things that are eternal and looking at things that are unseen. Last week, Pastor Glenn gave one of the best teachings you're ever going to hear about the holy angels and how they cause us to be in awe of the God who created them. This week, I'd like to look into the word together with you and explore what the scriptures say about our adversary, the devil, and the certainty of his defeat. We're going to talk about anticipating the adversary, anticipating the adversary. Let's pray and ask God's help as we look into the word together today. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us the gift of your word. It's a lamp for our feet and it's a light for our pathway. Jesus said that the word of God is like seed. So Lord, we pray that our hearts would be good soil in this time to receive and bear fruit from what it is you want to say to us. Jesus said that his words are spirit and life. So, Father, would you send the spirit and minister life from the words of Scripture to us now. Father, we ask that your glory would be here and that you would send the help of your holy angels. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, last summer, my neighbors and I experienced an invisible terror on our street. Some of you may know that Patty and I live up in Danbury, and in Danbury we have some spots that are just a little bit more country than what we have down here. Where I live, we've got beavers and bobcats and sometimes even bears. Oh my. But last summer, my quiet little street made the local news because of a very bold and troublesome predator. We had a hungry coyote on our street, and it threw us into an uproar. Even WCBS in New York reported on our visitor, and it said that it had developed a taste for dining on dogs and cats, and it even killed a pit bull. On another occasion, it was carrying off in its mouth a Jack Russell Terrier as a late night snack. But the little guy survived, and they think it was because the coyote hit the dog's invisible fence and got a shock and ran away. Everybody say, aww. Now, before the coyote was trapped and sent away, our neighborhood grew very quiet at night. Dogs and cats were no longer safe, and I think they knew it. People began to adjust and be more watchful of themselves, their kids and their pets. That's the notice that was going around my neighborhood. We had to listen carefully. We had to stay in the light of the spotlights and avoid the shadows where something might be watching. In much the same way as the coyote was stalking my street, and he's still out there this week, actually, he was in my yard, there is a very real predator that is out to get each one of us. This is a spiritual predator, and he's far more resourceful than any bobcat or coyote could ever be. The spiritual predator whom you and I need to guard against is known as Satan, and he is the adversary of the human race. He's also called the devil or the accuser. And acting together with the devil and serving under him are ranks of fallen angels and demons. Together they make up a host of malevolent spirits who have rebelled against the one true God and who currently refuse to bow the knee to our Lord. Church, hear me this morning. The devil is not a metaphor for evil. He is not just a symbol of some unresolved psychological conflicts that you may have. I know it's popular nowadays to talk about a person's inner, demon, inner demons, but no, he is a real and living creature. He is a conscious spiritual being who possesses a mind and a will. In the Bible, you can read how the Lord Jesus Christ and his apostles all considered Satan to be a literal person, not just some sort of picture of evil that lurks within the hearts of men. The Bible is clear that there is a real personal devil. He interacted with the Lord Jesus, tempting the master and harassing the disciples as they would later seek to spread the gospel into new territories. 
knowing that a hungry coyote is prowling outside your door will change your behavior. Caution is required. And if we're wise, then knowing that the adversary is lurking out there will also change the way we behave. The Apostle Paul said that he was not ignorant of Satan's devices. And I believe that God also wants to give us wisdom to prevail over this predator. God wants us to be able to anticipate the devil's operations against us. How many of you want to be able to anticipate the work of the devil in your life? As I look at what the Bible says about the devil and his demons, today I find three things to anticipate about our adversary. Three things to anticipate about our adversary. And the first one is this. Anticipate that the adversary will attack you. Anticipate that the adversary will attack you. Be under no illusions. Don't mistake those occasional periods of quiet for passivity on the devil's part. He has one objective, and it is to destroy you. I'm sorry to bear you a little bad news today before the good news, but Jesus said the thief does not come except to steal and kill and destroy. Aren't you so glad, though, that Jesus also said, but I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Praise the Lord. But let's not be naive. Satan has dedicated himself to your downfall. The Bible indicates that the demonic spirits which serve him are his assault troops, his ground troops, if you will, as he executes his plans to destroy. To this end, the demons interact with people having three main goals. First, deception. Deception, and particularly attempting to keep people blind to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Second, temptation. What they love to do is to seek to cause men and women to fall into sin and practice sin. And then also affliction, bringing attacks of different kinds such as causing physical and psychological suffering. You can see examples of all three of those strategies in the gospels in the book of Acts and the other writings of the New Testament. The adversary's malignant character can be seen in the names and titles that are given to him by Jesus and the writers of Scripture. The first title, of course, we all know, Satan. That first title, Satan, is a Hebrew word which means adversary or opponent. It means someone who stands in your way. He comes out and he gets up in your grill. He is someone who is a prosecutor. The Bible says that Jesus is our advocate. He's our defense attorney, if you like. You know, a hundred years ago when I practiced law, people used to say to me, well, all right, 50 years ago when I practiced law, people would sometimes ask me, how can you defend those people when you know they're guilty? And I got to the point where I got so tired of hearing that, I said, well, I don't know, but Jesus does it all the time. Amen. Aren't you glad that Jesus is your defense attorney and your advocate? Praise the Lord. But if that's the case, and it is, then Satan is the one who wants to see you prosecuted and condemned. The name Satan means that when you begin to walk in the direction of what is good, he comes out to oppose you as a personal enemy. He comes out to block your progress in life if he can. Second title that he bears is the devil. The word devil is from the Greek word diabolos. And of course, if you speak Spanish, you can hear diablo in there. The word diabolos in Greek means accuser. It means somebody who is slandering you. Somebody who comes along to speak evil of you. In scripture, you probably have heard that the devil is called the accuser of the brethren. He is the one who slanders Christians to the Father. And if we're not careful, we might learn some of his ways and become accusers of the brothers ourselves. God forbid. That word diabolos comes from a concept in Greek, a word in Greek which has the idea of throwing things at people. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that what the devil does? Don't you feel like the devil throws things at people? Now, if he could throw little, literal objects at you, I'm sure he would. But instead, what he throws at people is wicked words. Some would call the adversary the original sinner. He's the first of all sinners, and there's a reason for this. 
It seems likely from the scriptures that sin never had existed before in creation until it was formed and found within the heart of the devil. We can read about this in the 14th chapter of the book of Isaiah. That is a passage of scripture which seems to give us some clues as to the beginning of the devil's career as the devil. We don't know the devil's original name, but we can suggest on the basis of Isaiah 14 that it was Hillel, a Hebrew word that meant day star. And in your English Bibles, that word is commonly translated by the word Lucifer. I don't like the name Lucifer. In Latin, Lucifer means bringer of light. And church, if there's anyone who brought light to the earth, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not the devil. Amen? In Isaiah 14, there are a number of elements which cause us to believe that the prophet is really referring to Satan. Isaiah says this, How are you fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who did weaken the nations? For you've said in your heart, listen, this is how the devil became the devil. You've said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. How insolent. And God's response to that is, yet you shall be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. This passage indicates to us that Satan's fall was due to pride. It was due to his desire to exalt himself to the level of God himself and even above God. From another passage of scripture, Ezekiel 28, we can deduce that Satan was probably a cherub, one of the very high-ranking angels associated with the worship of God. Pastor Glenn explained last week about the cherubs and the seraphs and how they are the throne angels, the angels that are connected with worship. And the Bible tells us there, speaking to him, it says, You seal up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You have been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. So he was very beautiful. You are the anointed cherub who covers. You were upon the holy mountain of God. You've walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Listen, you were perfect, it says, in your ways from the day that you were created until iniquity was found in you. You. So from these two passages of scripture, we can suggest that Satan became inflated with pride because he had great power and great beauty and a position of great importance. Jesus called the devil the prince of this world. Very strange words indeed to come from the lips of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So perhaps we need to do just a little digging into the scripture to get understanding as to what the Lord Jesus could have meant by that. We understand from the book of Genesis that God created man to have dominion over the works of his hands. King David tells us in Psalm 8 how God made us to rule over everything he had made. And when Adam fell on that fateful day in the Garden of Eden, he became in a very real way the servant of Satan whose temptations he had obeyed. Now listen, this is a very important spiritual principle that we need to give heed to. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6, Do you not know, don't you know, that to whomever you present yourselves as slaves to obey, you are that person's slaves? Whether it's of sin, which leads to death, or whether it's of obedience, which leads to righteousness. Church, let's present ourselves as servants to the Lord Jesus Christ and experience good things from his hand. Amen? But when Adam disobeyed God and instead obeyed the devil, what happened? Adam's grant of authority, authority which he possessed from God, passed along to Satan. At that time, Satan became, in a real sense, the prince of this world. You'll remember in the gospel that Satan tempted the Lord Jesus Christ by offering him all of the kingdoms of the world. The gospel writers tell us that the devil took Jesus up, probably in vision, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory in a moment of time. I don't believe Satan was lying when he offered that to the Lord Jesus, because if he were lying, it certainly would not have been very much of a temptation. We can read this in Luke 4. It says, the devil said to him, said to Jesus, 
All this authority I will give to you and their glory, the glory of the kingdoms of the world. Listen, for that has been delivered to me and I give it to whomever I wish. What arrogance. Now that doesn't mean that the devil owns the earth, you know, the, the, the planet. Um, the Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But it does mean that the devil owned the world system. The world is something different from the earth. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, right? The world is something different from the earth. When you see the reference to the world in scripture, it means the governments of the world. It means the systems of the world, how the world is run, commerce and politics and religion and economics and all these things. That is the world system, the system of the age. And the devil is the prince of this world or age. Now you can see how because of the fall, man's situation was very dire indeed. Not only was he separated from God because of sin, not only was he subject to death, but he was also in servitude to Satan. Pastor Nick, have you got any good news today? <laughs> yes, we do, and it's coming. Hang on, you're going to be blessed. He's also called the God of this world. And when mankind fell, the adversary became the God of this age. Paul calls him that. Satan is the author of all false world religions, and he stands ready and he stands hungry to receive the worship of people who have left off worshiping the one true God. Satan is the one to whom the worship of the nations flows, and he longs to receive the glory of men who should be giving Glory to the Most High God. Paul says that the things which the Gentiles are sacrificing, they are actually sacrificing to demons, not to God. How many of you don't think Paul was very politically correct? That's not the most politically correct thing to say nowadays, but it's true nonetheless. Every non-Christian religion, except for Judaism, is praying to a God that men have created in their own minds with the very willing help of the adversary. And he is more than happy to be the beneficiary of that false worship. Another name we see ascribed to the adversary is Beelzebub. And the word Beelzebub, that name is a very convoluted history, but in essence, this means in the Gospels that Satan is the head of the demonic household. He's the ruler of the roost in the demonic kingdom. We know that a large number of the angelic spirits rebelled with Satan. There's a clue in scripture to suggest that the number was one third of the total number of angels. So the devil was apparently able to induce one third of God's holy angels to follow him in his foolishness. We read in Revelation 12, it says, There appeared another wonder in heaven, a great red dragon, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. The angels who fell together with Satan now serve him in administering the kingdom which he heads and which he has set up to oppose the kingdom of God. Among these, there are many powerful spirits who undoubtedly still have the vast intelligence and the great capabilities that Pastor Glenn laid out for you last week when he was sharing about the angels of God. There's also a host of lesser spirits whom we commonly call demons. And again, just as the devil is real, so are the angelic princes under his command, and so are his demons. Friends, I want you to know, demonic spirits are not the figment of some Hollywood writer's alcohol-fueled imagination. They're real. As we read the Gospels, we can see how demons harass people and are responsible for a variety of of evils which plague the human race. Every category of evil spirit seems to have its own sphere of responsibility in the devil's kingdom, and as the master of the house, he rules them with an iron fist. How many of you know that God rules his kingdom with love? Amen. But the devil rules his kingdom and his servants with cruelty and with fear. On that strategic level, if we could call it that, the princes and principalities that serve the devil, they administer his kingdom with him and they fight the spread of the kingdom of God and they oppose efforts to bring the gospel to people who need to hear it. 
If those fallen angels are the generals in the devil's army, then the demons are the infantry. They're the troops. The demons desire to afflict people, and indeed, people can be indwelt by demonic spirits. Pastor Glenn would say, I say this not to frighten you, I say this to terrify you. <laughs> the Bible gives the strongest of warnings against witchcraft and against dabbling in the occult because these things involve communication with demons and partnership with demons. Thank God we know that a person who is afflicted by demons can be delivered through the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ in his church. We'll have more to say about those matters over the next couple of weeks. Another name that we see associated with the adversary is Belial. You see that popping up in the Old Testament in a few places. That is a name that means that the devil is wicked or that he is worthless. And church, let me tell you that nothing that comes from the devil, nothing that he offers or gives you can add any worth or any value to your life. Paul asks us a very pointed question. He says, what profit did you derive out of those things you used to do which you are now ashamed of? It's a good question. Think back to your life, B.C., before Christ, and what profit do you have from those things of which you're now ashamed? Live like the devil, and you'll be ashamed, and your life will be worthless. A final name, thank God, that teaches us about Satan's character and activity is the Hebrew word Abaddon, translated into Greek. You see it in the book of Revelation as Apollyon. Apollyon is a name that means he is the destroyer, the destroyer. And that brings us back full circle to Jesus' warning that the devil only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Don't be naive. Don't be ignorant of his devices anticipate that your enemy will attack you. Don't expect a peace treaty or a truce from the devil. Second thing we can anticipate, anticipate that the adversary's activity on earth will escalate in your lifetime. Anticipate that the adversary's activity on earth will escalate in your lifetime. I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is that Jesus is coming. Somebody praise the Lord. Amen. The bad news is that Jesus is going to have to come for good reason. The Bible tells us that in the last days, God will pour out his spirit on all flesh, and that's good news. I want you to know that people are getting saved in unprecedented numbers, and they're doing so in unprecedented places around the world. But the devil is seeking to fight back and resist God's work of grace with vicious counterattacks and persecutions. You can read about persecutions popping up in all kinds of places around the world and horrible things being done to the followers of Jesus Christ. But I'm so very glad that nothing takes the Lord by surprise. And so God was faithful to us and warned us ahead of time. He said in the last days, perilous times would come. That is a word, that word perilous, which in the Bible means something that is exceedingly fierce, like the demonized man in the tombs. Paul told us in 1 Timothy 4, he says, Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Church, in the last days, the adversary is coming to people disguised as an angel of light. The devil does not come to people and say, hello, I'm the devil. I will take you to hell with me. <laughs> He's a little smarter than that. He comes as an angel of light. He comes with craftiness, just as he did in the garden, asking Eve, did God really say? He comes under the guise of someone who wants to bring help to you. He offers you new therapies, new treatments, new systems of self-improvement, but they're really only the same thing repackaged, invoking the help of demons under another name. America is currently undergoing what I like to refer to as a mass demonization, a mass demonization through subversive strategies such as introducing yoga and Reiki and astrology and a hundred other similar new age and occultic practices, 
Tens of millions of Americans are inviting demonic spirits into their daily lives and the lives of their children. We don't have time to discuss all the whys and wherefores about that. If you'd like to look into that more deeply, I would refer you to the, uh, to the teaching that we did on spiritual strongholds when we taught the Fresh Look course uh, some weeks ago this spring. You can see that on YouTube and see how the devil is adapting his tactics to be able to communicate his message to a modern and skeptical kind of people. Let me warn you, church, in these days, you must make it your priority to develop a love for the truth. We must be lovers of the truth. If you do not develop a love for the word, a deep-seated desire to know what truth is, you may be deceived by the greater deceptions that are yet to come. This is strong, but we need it. If we're already being swayed by the adversary on these things, how will we deal with what is on the way? Failure to care about truth. Listen, failure to care about truth is something that is weakening the immune system of our society and is causing our society to become vulnerable to spiritual infections of every kind. We are a spiritually, as a nation, we are a spiritually compromised patient that is vulnerable to spiritual infection, and it will result in spiritual catastrophe for millions. Paul told us that this very issue, what is it that will enable people to be deceived in the last days? Is it because the devil will do signs and false miracles and wonders and so forth? Well, that's certainly going to happen. We have it from no less an authority than the lips of Jesus himself. He said that many will come in my name saying, I am Christ. They'll deceive people with great signs and so forth. But Paul told us that failure to love the truth will create the atmosphere in which the Antichrist will eventually arise to lead man's final revolt against Jesus Christ. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2, by the way, spend some time reading those books that we don't often read. There's good stuff in there. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Why? Because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. Wow. If you can't say amen, say oh my. <laughs> Set your heart to love the truth no matter how unpopular or how uncool it gets. Solomon told us in Proverbs 23, listen to your father who begot you and do not sell her when she's old. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Church, Jesus is coming and the enemy will do everything he can to keep people from receiving the grace and truth that God is so lovingly sending down out of heaven to us. The righteous are growing up into the fullness of joy and blessing even while, Jesus said, at the same time, the devil's servants are growing up to the fullness of their harvest, a harvest of wickedness. Let's hold on to the Lord and his truth as we see the drama of the last days continue to unfold. Anticipate that the enemy will attack you. Anticipate that his activity is only going to increase and not decrease in the world in our lifetime. And then finally this, anticipate that Jesus Christ will defeat the adversary. Church, the devil is a powerful foe. Now we need to say that. I know that makes some Christians nervous. Pastor, don't talk about the devil. It scares me. I get nervous. I don't like to hear about those things. Well, I'm glad all the doctors and scientists of the past didn't feel that way about the diseases they were studying or else we would still have those diseases. Think about the logic, right? I don't want to study about that polio. I don't want to give it any glory by talking about it. No, thank God. See, the Bible says it's godly not to be ignorant. Don't be ignorant. Don't be naive about what the devil is and can do to people. 
and we need to say it. It needs to be said the devil is a powerful foe. No one on earth can match his intellect, his experience, his power and skill. But church, I have a word from heaven today for you. The devil is going down. The devil has already peaked. And because of Jesus' blood, it's only going to be all downhill for him from this point and forward. See, Satan was already kicked out of the highest heaven when he fell. Jesus said, I beheld Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now, I mentioned I used to be a lawyer, and I know that when you have a problem tenant in Connecticut or New York, it's really hard to evict people. Not in heaven. Get out. Boom. Down. Done. The adversary has already lost his position and his holy glory. Once upon a time, he was the anointed cherub that covers. Some Bible scholars think that means that all the worship went through him. He was the cherub that covered the ark of God's presence. And that worship flowed and streamed through him to God. He was once that anointed covering cherub. But now he's just the most notable member of a tribe of rebels that's on its way to destruction. He no longer has the privilege of being in the worship of heaven. He no longer is there when the pillars of heaven shake and the seraphim cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. He no longer gets to bask in the glow of that heavenly worship. Not only has he been expelled from that heavenly worship, but one day he'll be kicked out of the heavenlies altogether during the great tribulation to come. In our current era, we see that Satan still seems to have some limited access to the presence of God, and he uses those opportunities to slander believers in Christ. But there will come a point at which he will be finally and definitively hurled down to the earth, and then he will be denied further access to the heavenly realms. In Revelation 12, we read, There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and did not prevail. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ because the accuser of our brethren has been cast down who accused them in front of God day and night. Praise the Lord. Soon after this, it'll get even worse for the devil because he'll be thrown into the abyss. When Jesus returns in triumph to inaugurate his kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy, the devil will be confined and prohibited from deceiving the nations for a thousand years. Church, can you imagine the beauty of a world without demonic temptations, without demonic defilements? Praise the Lord. In Revelation 20, we read, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon. I like that. You know, the devil's very powerful, but when God means business, when God wants to wrap it up, he just grabs an angel and says, hey, you go down there and grab him. And he bound him for a thousand years and says, and he cast him into the bottomless pit. But that's not the end. It gets even worse from there for your adversary. Ultimately, he and his wicked followers will be thrown into the lake of fire. The Bible teaches us that the holy angels will enjoy the kingdom of God together with the redeemed. But God hasn't made any way of redemption for the fallen angels, and they will be tormented in the fire forever. In fact, Jesus said, you may recall, that uh, hell was actually created specifically for the devil and his angels, not for man. Revelation 20 verse 10 says, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and false prophet are, and they'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. That is the fate of the devil which is coming, and I, for one, will be glad to see him go. How about you? I'm glad that God is going to punish this destroyer of men's lives. His fate is sealed and certain. But I think I'm more excited about the fact that Jesus now enables us to defeat him personally. In James 4, 7, the Bible says, Submit to God, 
Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Yes, the devil's destined for defeat, but Jesus enables his people to have victory over Satan now in the here and now. Somebody ought to praise the Lord about that. God has already obtained the ultimate victory over Satan and made a way for us to return to God. It's through the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Through the sacrifice of Jesus the Messiah, through the shedding of his precious blood, God obtained victory for the human race. Victory over sin and death and over all the power of the devil. You know that after Jesus was raised from the dead, he said this at the end of Matthew's gospel. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Jesus said, I am he, I am the one who lives and yet was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, amen. And he said, I have the keys of hell and death. Praise Jesus. John tells us in his first letter that Jesus was manifested, the Son of God was manifested for this reason, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Somebody praise the Lord. Pastor Jason, you can come back. If you will. Church, when you face your temptations with the word of God, I don't care what they are, the Holy Spirit will uphold you with his invincible power. I want you to know that that's how Jesus mastered every temptation. The Bible says he was tempted in all ways, all ways. Think of the things you're tempted with, and the Bible says Jesus was tempted in every way, just as human beings are, yet without sin. So you say what Jesus said. You learn the word of God, and when you're tempted, you say like Jesus, it is written, it is written, it is written, and you watch the devil slinking away from you in frustration. When you're weak, when you're lonely, when you're tired, when you're in need, call upon the name of Jesus. Pray without ceasing and see Jesus Christ coming to you with his divine strength. Jesus said, behold, I give you authority, you, 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 and you, to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm you. Pray without ceasing and watch the devil's works in your life implode and collapse from within while God builds something beautiful out of what you think are the ruins of your life. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Satan is afraid of the glory of the risen Christ that's in your spirit. My Bible says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal and weak, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You know, church, right now, before Jesus returns, we live in a very strange phase in the history of the world. Christ has already prevailed over the devil, but God has not yet chosen to take back the full exercise of his dominion over the world system. I explained to you the difference between the planet Earth and the world system. But that day is coming very soon. You can read about it in Revelation 11. I want everybody to go read Revelation 11. That'll be your homework this week. It says, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were great voices in heaven. Now, how many of you enjoy at Christmas time, you listen to Handel's Messiah, and you love the Hallelujah Chorus, and you listen to all that? All right, a couple of people have heard of it. Well, this is where it comes from. It says, there were great voices in heaven saying, listen, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat in front of God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God, saying, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, who are and were and are to come because you have taken your great power to yourself and you have begun to reign that great day hasn't come yet nevertheless everyone who receives the salvation that God offers through the blood of Jesus Christ is living under the kingship of God already everyone who receives Jesus and worships him as king gets set free now from their bondage to the adversary Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 1, he said, God has already delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and he has removed us. It says he's translated us, your Bible may say. It really means like raptured. 
He has literally just taken us and transferred us out of the kingdom of darkness and translated us over into the kingdom of his beloved son. And that's good news, church. What can you anticipate and what can you expect? Well, don't be naive. Expect your adversary to attack you. It comes with the package. Second, anticipate that because God has chosen you to live in this era of history, anticipate that the adversary's efforts and activity will increase the deeper we move into the last days. But then you can also expect a great victory through the power of Jesus Christ. Why? Because greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. Come on, stand to your feet and let's give Jesus a great praise. Come on, somebody shout the name of Jesus in this place. Come on, somebody exalt the Lord who's clothed in majesty. Hallelujah, Jesus. We exalt you, Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, I asked Pastor Jason if he'd lead us in that great song of worship to our King. Hosanna, I want you to lift your hands and let's bless Jesus, the King of Kings, today. Hosanna in the Come on, make a praise. Make a praise and a shout to him of this forever and ever. Oh, come on, somebody shout the name of Jesus in this house. Come on. He's worthy. He's worthy. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, we love you so much. We honor you, Lord Jesus, as King of kings and Lord of lords. We pledge our allegiance to you. Jesus today. Lord, we don't want to follow any rebel, Lord, or any rebellious spirit. We want to walk in the good way, Lord, that you're laying out for your people. Walk in the good way as your counsel to your people, Lord. We follow you. The way out of the devil's dominion, the key, the key out of his kingdom is the name of Jesus Christ in his blood. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And if you don't have a personal relationship with God today through the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to invite you today to come to Jesus in sincerity and turn away from your own ways. That's what the word repentance means. It means to have a change of heart. You're going in one direction and you turn around and you go the other direction. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Let's pray together right now. I want to invite us all to pray out loud. And let's give some friends the opportunity to receive the forgiveness and receive new life through Jesus Christ. Come on, repeat this with me. Say, Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I'm sorry for my sins. I need forgiveness and your abundant life. Jesus, I confess you are Lord. I turn from my own ways now. I believe that God raised you from the dead to save me. Forgive my sins. Fill me with your spirit. Give me the fresh start that I need today. Help me to walk with you every day. Amen and amen. Thank you, Jesus. Give thanks to the Lord. Thank you. If you prayed that way for the first time today, a prayer like that, then we want to invite you right after we conclude our service in just a couple moments, come to the front. There'll be some friends here to talk with you, pray with you, and we want to give you some materials that'll help you get started in a new life through Jesus Christ. Let's bow our hearts and pray, and I just want to take one more moment to pray and ask the Lord to help us. I want to pray for each person here that we will each once again walk in the victory that the Lord Jesus has provided for us. Let's take a brief moment, ask God to help us to walk in overcoming victory, the victory that he's made available. Come Holy Spirit, would you circulate throughout this room? Lord, if there's anything in the hearts of any one of us 
that's displeasing to you, that might be short-circuiting the work of your power, your grace in our lives. We confess it to you, Lord. Be encouraged, church, because God says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we submit to you again. We know that we need to resist the devil, but Father, we heard today that the first thing we need to do to prevail in combat with him is to submit to God. So Father, we submit to you again. We turn back to you, Lord. We give you our whole heart, our whole spirit, and soul and body. Say this. Say, Father, I belong to you. Lord, we commit again to doing it your way. Lord, I pray that you will give your saints fresh encouragement, Lord, to walk on your road of truth. Every person here, come on, before you go, would you lift your hands to the Lord and just invite the Holy Spirit to come into your life with fresh strength, fresh strength and life from God to be refreshed. Jesus said that when the Holy Spirit comes, he said he will take of what is mine and he will minister it to you. So receive healing, receive strength from the Lord Jesus Christ today. The word of God says the Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. The Lord's healing. I believe the Lord is physically touching and healing people right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Somebody needs to hear the word today that says that he who began a good work in you will continue to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. See, the devil says, I'm coming out in the road to get in your grill. But Jesus said, nope, that person there is going to make it. He's going to make it. You're going through. You're going to overcome. Paul said, in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Come on, give the Lord one more hand clap of praise. Let's sing that song again, Pastor Jason, before we go and bless Jesus. Come on, let's sing. Yeah.